So I'm from a company called CWP Renewables. I'm a development manager and CWP is, is essentially a, a renewable energy development firm. And uh, so today I'm essentially going to give you a bit of an overview about who we are, why we're in the area, what we've been doing in the Central West region and other parts of New South Wales. Uh, and also I'm going to talk specifically about uh, Crude Iron Ridge Wind Farm, which is uh, a, a proposed wind farm about 40 kilometres west of here. And, uh, and also going to kind of talk you through some of the drivers for renewable energy. And so the talk today might be a bit different from some of the things you, you discussed yesterday. <coughs> Excuse me. But I think what I, what I wanted to get across was, was that, um, you know, this is a new form of land use for this part of New South Wales. It's something that's, that's uh, being experienced in Victoria, South Australia and other parts of New South Wales, but hasn't really uh, occurred much here. And so I just want to kind of talk people through some some of the ways that uh, wind farms interact with land and landowners, uh, and also just take any questions. So, yeah, if we can move to the next slide, thanks. So, as I said, CWP is a, uh, we're a renewable energy development firm primarily. Uh, we've got uh, over two decades of wind experience, so it kind of came together through a joint venture of two major wind and solar development firms coming out of Europe. We're an Australian based firm. We've got uh, experience in development, construction and operation of wind farms in New South Wales and we've been doing it since about 2007. So we're one of the earlier firms to, to, have, um, to have started projects in New South Wales. I'm based in Newcastle, so our development team is based there. We're a pretty small unit, we've got about six, six to eight people at any given time. And uh, we have an asset management team in, in Canberra who deals with operations of wind farms uh, at particularly two sites that we have uh, down in the south of the state. Uh, so we're an expanding business, we're definitely growing at the moment. We've got a pipeline of around uh, 1.4 gigawatts, and so if nobody knows what a gigawatt is, I don't blame you. Essentially what it means is there's probably about uh, six large projects that we have in development. Uh, we've got the full life cycle expertise as well, as I said. We'll just go to the next slide. Thanks, Lucas. So I'll try not to bore you too much with this. People probably, most people are probably aware of renewable energy target. It's essentially the, the aspirational goal for renewable energy in Australia. It's something that was debated quite a lot over the past few years, particularly in the Abbott government. So the renewable energy target was reduced significantly in the Abbott government, which essentially stalled all renewable energy development in Australia, except for rooftop solar. And so, but finally we've got bipartisan support now, which has uh, given a lot of confidence back in, in uh, the Australian investment side of things. So there's a lot of investment, capital investment coming into Australia for renewables, and the market is very much, very hot right now in terms of uh, projects that are going to proceed to construction in the next few years. Just on the left side of the slide here, you'll see a bit of a bar chart. So what that shows is that we're less than halfway to meeting 23.5% of our renewable target. At that bar chart, we're less than halfway there, and that's with 15 years of renewable energy being developed in Australia. So the first wind farms were established in the year 2000, and in 15 years, we've only reached 15,000 gigawatts. So we've now got to get up to 33,000 gigawatts in the next four, four years. So there's a big, big gap to make up. And the, the graphs on the right uh, just kind of show what, what makes up renewable energy in Australia at the moment. So at the end of 2015, hydro was around 6%, so it's our biggest contributor, and mainly that's coming out of the Snowy Scheme and also out of Tasmania. Uh, wind makes up about 5% at the moment, and solar is half that, and that's rooftop solar. So rooftop solar is a big contributor to Australia's renewable energy. Uh, and, uh, and large scale solar is far less, but that will change quite a bit. So, uh, this slide is uh, essentially to show you state by state how our, electric, our electricity is produced. So the graphs on the top, essentially uh, you'll notice that Tasmania has a very high penetration of renewables. We've got a lot of hydro. They've got uh, quite a lot of uh, gas supply, but they've also got a huge amount of uh, yeah, hydro, as I said, and a small amount of wind and solar. South Australia also has pretty high penetration, 41% or thereabouts. Everyone kind of 
is attempting to convince people that wind is the problem in South Australia. In fact, there's also a huge amount of rooftop solar happening in South Australia. And both of those two states, Tasmania and South Australia, have one single connection point to the rest of the national electricity market. That's the big problem, is that they only have one common point of connection, which means that they're extremely vulnerable to outages and fluctuations in, in wind and, and sun in particular. So the three big consumers, of course, are Victoria, South, uh, Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland. The black and the brown indicate coal consumption. And then uh, the pink is gas. You'll notice that Victoria has some wind there in the green and also solar on the right. New South Wales and Queensland have virtually no wind contributing to the market at the moment. So it's a very, very little amount of wind compared to the rest of the, uh, the energy supply. Okay, so uh, this slide essentially shows that power, the amount of power that's being generated out of renewable, renewable resources is attributed to the various different types, as I said. Hydro is the biggest contributor, followed by wind. And solar is, is far less than, than wind at the moment. However, in the last year, there's been a 20% increase in both wind and large-scale solar. So that's because those two technologies are the cheapest form of electricity to build, bar none. They're cheaper than coal, they're cheaper than gas, they're cheaper than everything else. Next. So there's, there's a lot of growth happening in the wind industry at the moment. So and last year there was five wind farms commissioned in Australia. Three of those were in Victoria and two of them were in New South Wales. So I put this slide up because the, the top one, which is uh, located at Taralga, and the fourth one, which is located at Boca Rock, they were projects which CWP was involved in the construction of, and we're also managing, managing them through operations as well. So we're stationed at those sites. At the end of last year, there was three other wind farms under construction in Australia, and since that time, there's been at least three more which have moved to construction, and there may be two more before the end of this year which will go to construction as well. So the industry is starting to move very fast now that there's a lot of investment because of that confidence in the renewable energy target. Alright, so I don't want to bore you too much with slides and slides and slides about uh, the renewable energy target, but essentially what it means is in order to meet that big gap between where we are now and where we aspire to be in 2020, there needs to be about $40 billion of capital investment. So it's not small change. And there's a lot of, lot of capital investment coming in and it's going to create around 15,000 jobs just in the construction phase. And then during operations there's fewer jobs but they are longer term jobs. So over the next five years we're going to see a lot of activity. So I'll talk now about uh, Crudon Ridge Wind Farm. I just want to see a show of hands if I could about anyone who's... Is anyone familiar with Crudon Ridge? Has anyone... Yeah, we've got one, two, a few... A handful of people, okay, good. So this is uh, Luke's, we can just move on. Then. So this is a wind farm which is a proposed project and it's located uh, around about 40 kilometres west of here. So if you can see Ralston and Candos in the middle of the, of the map there, about yeah, 40 kilometres southwest uh, along the Crudine Ridge. So the Crudine Road comes off, uh, comes off the Castleway Highway and heads towards the farther. Uh, that's essentially where we've, we've got the, the site to propose there. Thanks. So the wind farm itself is, uh, we're proposing up to 77 turbines as part of the project. And so the maximum tip height for those turbines would be 160 metres. So and this, that's, a, that's a fairly moderate sized turbine as far as the technology goes these days. We're seeing some projects where turbines are installed up to 200 metres and there's some projects in the north of the state which are seeing bigger machines. The bigger machine essentially means they're more efficient. They can create more energy from a lower wind resource. So the capacity of Crudine Ridge would be around about 135 megawatts uh, which basically means it's enough to power nearly 60,000 homes every year and a, a greenhouse gas saving of around 350,000 uh, tonnes. So a fairly significant contributor, but as far as wind farms go, it's, it's, it's about a moderate sized wind farm. It's not a, not a very large site, it's not a very small site. 
So, you know, people in the community will say, well, that's great, but what, what do we actually get out of it? So, the key advantages for the local community, first and foremost, are that those landowners who are putting forward their land for the wind farm are getting direct income for it. So that's, that's the biggest contributor that we have to the local economy. We also know that it's going to generate around 200 jobs throughout the construction phase. So it's about a two year period where there'll be 200 jobs in the region. And there's of course a lot of spin-off supply contracts for that. So we've got everything from uh, you know, accommodation, uh, supply of services, uh, transport, haulage, earthworks, civil and electrical engineering, all of those kind of aspects of a typical construction project. And we expect that most of that will come out of the Mudgee and Bathurst and Ralston region. So the Central West and Bathurst local government areas. So as part of our proposal, we're uh, going to be contributing about $168,000 annually to uh, Midwest and Bathurst community funds. And so what that means is, is uh, typically how we set up is that you know, community organisations which are looking for funds to do local projects whether they be sporting groups, environmental groups, aged care facilities, any of those kind of community groups can apply to that fund to receive funds every year. And that, so that's essentially provided through a voluntary plan. <coughs> so the project would cost around about 300 million to build. It's fairly large dollars. And it really, I mean, what, a, what we see is that it's an opportunity for the regional economy of the Central West to diversify out of those typical mineral projects, which are fairly fairly big contributors to the economy, but it allows the opportunity to diversify and uh, and provide a, a separate source of income for the region. So this is the project. So you'll see uh, to the north of the site. I don't know. If, well, some of you will obviously be familiar with the area. Some of you may not. Off to the right hand side of the screen is the Castleway Highway running between Bathurst and Mudgee. And then to the north of the, scre north of the screen here, there's Aaron's Pass Road. So Aaron's Pass Road is the primary access for the site. That's where most of the uh, turbine components will be delivered. And the blue dots here are each of the, the approved turbine locations under the New South Wales approval. And we've also got a transmission line which runs uh, east from the project across to the existing uh, transmission line which is there in red. So the yellow line heading east is a, is a 132 kV transmission line. So this, this is the layout of the project. You can also see down in the bottom left hand screen we've got a fairly large offset property that's been uh, proposed as part of the project and that's to compensate for loss of habitat <coughs> and associated impacts with the project. Thank you. Okay, so this is a wind turbine, <laughs> unless you're not familiar with them. And I just put this one on there because uh, it's about the same scale as what would be constructed at Crudon. So this turbine itself is around 150 metres. The one at Crudon, one's at Crudon will, it will be up to 160 metres. Uh, and the tree there on the right is around about 15 metres tall, to give you a bit of a, bit of a scale of reference there. So the project itself was granted approval from the Planning Assessment Commission earlier this year. So the New South Wales approval has been granted and then an assessment report is provided from uh, the State Department to the Commonwealth Department for them to make their decision. The Commonwealth has issued a, uh, a recommended approval which contains the assessment, the proposed conditions and we're just waiting to receive the final approval for that project which, uh, which we're looking forward to soon. So, and the approvals contain a pretty, uh, a pretty good typical set of construction management uh, plans, other plans for operational phases of the project to ensure that we adhere to the conditions of the approval. Uh, there's the burden bad adaptive management plans, which essentially are a monitoring and, and mitigations plan to a, a address any impacts uh, to birds and bats. It's a biodiversity offset plan, as I said, which I'll discuss in a little bit more detail. And of course, all the, your typical measures like uh, traffic management plans, road dilapidation surveys, road maintenance measures, etc. Okay, so this might be a little bit more interest to some of the people in the room here. So we've identified a, a property on Hill End Road, which is about 674 hectares. 
It's a property which has been in the same hands for, uh, for over 50 years and it's currently a very low intensity pastoral holding. So it's an area which is, which is grazed, but not grazed in, in, uh, in heavy density. And it's got really good condition box gum woodland and stringer bark woodland as well. And those are the two, uh, those are two vegetation types which are impacted by the project. So we've reached an agreement with that landowner to, to purchase that land and establish a, a biobank agreement on the land. And uh, as part of that process, we'll be conducting further surveys on the site, going through the biobank assessment methodology to establish uh, an offset in perpetuity on that, on that property. So on that offset, we'll, uh, we'll provide about 20 to 1 for the impacts that are experienced at, at the wind farm itself. So it's, it's, it's far in excess of what's required under our approvals, uh, but we think it's a, it's a really great property. Uh, the landowner has been very forthcoming with, with, um, uh, with uh, assisting with the work being done on the land. And, uh, and the other advantage is that it's very close to the project, so it allows us to easily manage the project and the property itself. Okay, so getting to, getting to the land, finally. So we've got land that will be leased from around 17 freehold landowners. Uh, and so the lease arrangements are uh, for an initial, initial term of 25 years. So wind farms have a typical life expectancy between 20 and 30 years. And at the end of that period, projects will either be uh, refurbished and repowered. So that means you'll replace the turbines or you can go through and replace certain components of turbines, uh, or it will be removed and decommissioned. Okay, so there's a 25 year lease and there's also options for renewal that we have with those landowners. So in the leases, they allow for construction, operations and decommissioning of wind turbine generators, access tracks, power lines, one substation location across the project, and a construction and operations compound. Okay, so that, that's, that's all that's involved in a wind farm, those, those five components there. And the farming activities will continue throughout the life of the project. So the project itself won't hamper farming activities. The biggest change that will be experienced on the land is an access track, which I'll show some photos of. And the wind farm, this is a question which is often asked of us, is the wind farm is ultimately responsible for decommissioning of all infrastructure. So none of it falls to the landowner, it's always with the project owner. So this is just an example of a typical lease agreement, or a, a plan on the lease agreement. So you can see that the wind farm has a certain layout, and on the screen here the red dots indicate turbine locations, and next to each of those red dots there's a little square, and that square is a, it's a crane hard stand, and then there are access tracks going between each of the turbines. So none of the access tracks will have cables, or there may be some overhead transmission. But that's all it is. The blue line is a bit of a buffer area which allows some flexibility for us to move that prior to construction. But when we move to construction, all that will be on the land is an access track, a hard stand and a turbine. So this is a, an example of, um, of the Boko Rock wind farm, which was a project that was commissioned in 2015. It's down near Kuma, between Kuma and uh, Bombala. So, as you can see, these, these turbines are around about the same size. Again, they're 150 odd metres. You can see the access tracks there. They're hard uh, gravel access tracks, six metres wide. Uh, whenever they cross a, a project boundary, uh, sorry, a landowner boundary, there'll be a cattle grid or a set of fences. Those fences, uh, sorry, gates. Those gates are agreed with the landowners. Uh, and we can keep on scrolling through these if you don't mind. And so this is just another perspective, and you can see. On the down on the bottom left, there's obviously a lot of existing dams and infrastructure that people have on their land. So we, we do what we can to work around that infrastructure. It's very flexible. So the, the turbine locations are probably the least flexible aspect of the project. Everything else can be moved. So roads can be moved, hard stands can be moved, and that's, there's quite a long process of reaching that agreement with the landowners. So this, is a, this is what it looks like from the top of a... a uh, a turbine tower. So we have these guys that um, work for the turbine manufacturers who are on operations and maintenance contracts and they spend their lives 
climbing up and down the towers, or if they're lucky, there'll be an elevator inside there. Uh, and uh, and they get a great view. And there are some good photo, good um, videos online on YouTube where um, uh, where often you see these guys sunbathing on the top of the uh, on the top of them in the cells. They're uh, a bit of a crazy bunch to, to be working up there. It's fairly confined space, but it's also over 100 metres in the air, so it's a bit of a unique um, work environment. Thanks. Where are they made? Where are they made? Good question. So turbine components are manufactured all around the world. It's pretty rare for them to be manufactured in Australia. There are some towers being manufactured in Victoria for some projects at the moment, but blades are not. So the blades, are, they're fairly advanced technology. They're a kind of composite material, and there's, uh, they're manufactured in Brazil, uh, Vietnam, uh, Germany, some parts of Africa, <coughs> other than China. There's very, a very big uh, construction. Can we get hemp blades? Pardon me? Can we get hemp blades? Hemp blades. <laughs> Hasn't been done yet. <laughs> So look, I'm being given the, uh, the, the wind up here. So essentially, look, this is going to be a very, uh, a very big contributor to uh, the changing face of land use in New South Wales over the next few years, four years in particular. And, uh, and Crude Iron Wind Farm is just one of those projects. And we're very happy to answer any questions you've got. Um, and uh, but before I get to the, both of those questions, um, just want to let you know that we've established a database of contractors and suppliers, and if you're interested in registering or finding out more, visit the website or uh, come and see me.